Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last session of this program. Uh, the over last three days, uh, we have cover. Uh, we have got a quite an overview and little bit detail around uh, implementation of digit, how you can utilize it in your various implementations while working with the different state governments or the government uh, uh, otherwise. Uh, in the urban local bodies as well as the applicabilities of these in the rural uh, bodies as well in some of the programs. Uh, we, uh, over the last two days, we have covered uh, the overview implementation, DevOps, architecture, microservices. We saw a few product demos and understood how uh, Digit was implemented in various uh, the state governments and how uh, this has been utilized. Today, again, we looked at how Digit could be recon uh, could be configured uh, in your implementation customization. We saw uh, how uh, the new module, which was not part of the Digit core services, was built on top of Digit at a special request and uh, was contributed back to the Digit open source. In this session, again, we'll look at how can you design an altogether new domains on uh, on top of digit and for that we have subhashni with us uh, subhashni will take us through the customization and development of new domains on top of digit uh, again uh, needless to say you can interact uh, with us on chat you can leave your questions in q a tab and at the end of the session we'll appreciate your feedback uh, so that uh, we know how can we make these sessions more meaningful for future engagements. I'll stop here, over to you, Subhash. Hey Vibhav, thank you. Good afternoon, audience. Uh, nice to have you here at uh, 3 p.m. And I hope to keep you engaged for the next one hour or so. So uh, my name is Subhashni and I'm a senior architect with the Digit Platform team. And today we are going to talk about uh, building new domains on top of Digit. So let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, before you can see my screen, right? Right, we can see your screen. Okay, awesome. So we're gonna talk about building for new domains. And before we start off, um, before, can we just send out that poll again? Uh, just want to get a feel for the audience mix here before we get started. So I'm launching this poll. Uh, we'll just keep it about for say 30 to 40 seconds. Yes. We have about 26 people in the audience and let's see how many response we get. Okay. I hope many of you or maybe all of you have attended some of the earlier sessions. I gave a digit architecture session a couple of uh, days ago on Tuesday. Uh, this session is going to kind of build on top of all these other sessions that have happened. So it's going to be a little bit of a deeper dive and I will not go over some of the, uh, you know, high level overview architecture and stuff again here. So I hope that's going to be okay with the majority of the audience. You can always leave your comments in the chat box. I have got decent responses and I'm sharing those results with you. Uh, okay, awesome. So we've got a majority developer population and we've got a few managers and some others. So great, thank you folks. We'll get started just before starting off. I have three observations to make here. Number one, um, this the content in this uh, presentation is going to cover various aspects of the software development lifecycle. Uh, we call it SDLC. Now, SDLC is a vast uh, topic, right? And there are many different uh, methods of building software, testing them, et cetera, et cetera. So we are not going to get into the semantics of that. And I'm sure as professionals, you all have you know, built and implemented multiple projects. Uh, your own way. This is just uh, to share what we do at Digit, the processes that we follow, the design principles that we follow. And we just want to share it with you all in case that is helpful for you. But by no means, this is the only way to do something. Okay, that is number one. Number two, again, the uh, topic is pretty vast. 
So I'm going to try to cover it as best as I can, but it might still end up being just a high level view for some of you who want a deeper dive. For those of you who really want to go deep into it, we will have upcoming sessions, partner sessions, workshops, and other webinars coming up in the next few months. And we'll also launch some certifications and things like that. So that is something that you can look forward to and that will give you the kind of content you uh, want. Uh, number three, uh, again, you know, a lot of you may have questions and we welcome those and we'll try our best to answer that in this session. But since the topic is extremely vast and the devil is in the details and the nitty gritties, we may not be able to answer all your questions to the fullest in a minute or so. So in that case, please be patient with us and you know reach out to us separately and we'll be happy to answer all your questions. So these are the three things. So now let's get started. Okay, so all of you must have seen these slides, right? EGov is building digital public goods. We've got four primary platforms right now, four primary domains that we work in, urban, health, uh, public finance and sanitation, okay? Um, and we have a lot of partners. We are trying to build an ecosystem of partners who will, uh, you know, build on top of digit. Now, these four domains were, you know, conceived uh, by eGov, but we want to invite you all to imagine other domains on top of digit, right? You know, and uh, think of what all can you build? What are all the problems that you are seeing uh, in the governance domain? And what are some of the new domains? Maybe it could be legal, maybe agriculture, maybe education. Possibilities are endless. So hopefully this session will sort of just spark that enthusiasm in you to maybe go explore digital a little, uh, little bit more uh, in the domain that you are looking at at the moment. Um, so we've already got a bunch of partners. We are looking to add more. So uh, let's see what comes out of this session. So just a digit refresher before we get started. This is the architecture diagram that I had gone over in detail a um, couple of days ago. And I'm just adding this in here for reference in case any of you have questions later, but I'll not go over this, okay? Uh, Digit is a microservices based architecture and that's where I'll leave it at. Uh, and again, a terminology refresher for some of you, uh, registries, services and APIs and reference data or master data. These four terms you'll keep hearing repeatedly. Registries are a single source of truth. This is validated. Uh, verified data, which is uh, reusable across modules or even across domains. Examples are, you know, a citizen registry or a property registry. A citizen registry can be reused across multiple domains, right? It's not specific to urban or it's not specific to sanitation. Similarly, a property registry could be used across domains uh, in the urban space, in the trade license space, in a water connection, maybe electricity, things like that. So that's what a registry is. Services are services, right? Services help you mutate the registries that they work on. And these are typically microservices. And APIs are basically the um, uh, interface to the rest of the world for integration. And you know what APIs are. And we've also got master data or reference data, which is essentially data that belongs to a particular module, but it's not a registry. You know, it's like uh, unchanging data, fixed static data that you can configure for a module. Uh, examples are property types, trade license types, boundary hierarchies, things like that, okay? Okay, so the first, so I'm going to take you through how we are doing the design process in Digit when you look at a new domain, okay? A new module, new domain, this is applicable to all those things. And like I said, you have to be patient with me. Some of this may be preaching to the choir because you already are professionals who are working in software. So this might sound a little bit redundant. So just bear with me. So, you know, the first step is essentially um, gather requirements, right? You need to make sure you understand the domain that you are in and you need to define the problem that you're trying to solve and gather all the domain related information and business related information before we start designing any software, not just on digit anyway. So this is a quote that I'm really fond of uh, by Edward Berard, who's a famous, who was a famous academician in the 1950s. Uh, he has written a number of papers and books. Uh, walking on water and developing software from a specification are both easy if both are frozen. A lot of the problems that masquerade as engineering problems are really problems 
you know defining requirements understanding the business and once that is sorted engineering is typically a fairly simple straightforward thing that can be done okay so uh, the, the hardest part of defining any software is in gathering the requirements usually a product person or a business analyst is involved in this phase along with domain experts uh, to understand the problem that needs to be solved and put together a detailed set of uh, requirements okay and on a funnier note i just want to share this i hope you guys can see it hang on can you see the comic strip here yep yeah so this is dilbert okay not dilbert by the creator of dilbert uh, but basically it's a funny comic strip about you know gathering requirements we don't have time to gather product requirements i want you to start designing the product anyway otherwise it will look like we aren't accomplishing anything right of all my projects i like the doomed ones best so if we don't gather requirements properly we are going to be doomed right from the outset okay so the first step is gathering requirements again this is very domain specific and it's very business specific so this is all we can say at this point once you've got your requirements what is the next thing you can do when you're trying to build on digit right model your requirements so what does that really mean so uh, in digit i told you we have services we have registries we have roles we have reference data now from your requirements document you are required to figure out what needs to be a registry what are the services you need to build now that seems like a daunting task at the beginning so what do you do here we have tried to break it down so we at uh, eager follow a design led uh, a workflow led design process okay so we create what are called these swim lane diagrams or process workflow diagrams so um, many of you may be familiar with this otherwise please just google and you'll find out what is a swim lane diagram essentially you are trying to model your entire process end to end as a swim lane as a workflow diagram right uh this is typical flow chart stuff you've got decision boxes uh, you've got a process start and you've got a process end so in any government department there is always usually a workflow involved uh and in that so in the swim lane diagrams you basically have to have the various different actors in the system as horizontal bars or vertical bars right you have an applicant a citizen a verifier an approver okay and what is happening here in this particular process which we have taken as an example somebody is applying for let's say a birth certificate right so the citizen typically applies for the birth certificate hang on let me see if i can pull up a laser pointer i don't think i can can i okay i'll just annotate uh spotlight okay i hope you guys can see okay then all right okay we'll just make do with this so you've got an applicant uh, who's applying for a birth certificate right then they make a payment and then you know uh, the application goes to a some government employee for whatever department right and maybe they have the role of verifying the application so they are going to sit and verify the application if it is uh, valid if the application is valid they are going to send it to the approver to approve the application now if the approver has any queries about the application he is going to send it back to the verifier and ask for more information otherwise the approver is going to say the application is approved and we are going to come to this box which is send notification right and then from sending notification you can uh, basically your thing has been approved so a notification will go to the citizen and they can download the birth certificate now if the application could not be verified it basically uh, failed a few checks right again we need to send a notification to the citizen and ask them to update the application with a bunch of information so this is a very very simple workflow that we have put together your workflows can be more complex or less complex or you may have no workflow at all depending on what it is but this is typically how it works now if you look at the swim lane diagrams you see all the various different roles on the left hand side these are the actors in your system okay and these are the activities that they are going to do when they are interacting with your system all the different boxes now model these activities in the verb noun pattern what does that mean it means that when you say download certificate right you are saying download which is a verb certificate is a noun the reason we say to do this is it's going to be easy to break this verb noun pattern into 
actions and registries if you do it this way of course there are other ways of doing it like i said there's no nothing set in stone but if you do this it's going to be much easier to break it down um so once you've got and you may have multiple uh, multiple swim lane diagrams right it may not be just one you could have more than one depending on what your uh, domain is uh, and once you have the workflow diagram set it becomes very easy to identify all the different configurations that need to flow from it the workflow diagrams uh, based on my own experience right it helps in bringing people together your own team together in understanding the requirements everybody knows exactly what is going to be the next step in the process and it makes it very simple for people to break down their domain into a simplistic workflow okay and from here you can get three pieces from the workflow diagrams you will be able to identify the actors in your system the actions that they will take and the states that these actions will lead to okay and we'll see more about this later basically these three pieces are going to form your workflow service configuration your mdms service configuration access control config and also some of your apis will flow from this process workflow diagram we'll talk more about that but for now you've done your workflow diagrams the next step is to elaborate the activities right uh, what all can a user do what all can each user do again this is something uh, you can do as either a user story or a use case user stories are very informal you can say you know as the developer i want to be able to do this or that i want to be able to click on a button and go to the next screen things like that a use case is a very formal way of capturing the exact steps and uh, you know alternate flows the user can follow again this is something that will come out of your product team most likely where they'll be able to identify your use cases figure out what the story is and uh, this has to be done in great detail eventually so that you will be able to even extract ui design from it okay so this is again just a very high level overview nothing specific to ego this is done across the board in product development teams um this one second okay so now this is now done now the next step in modeling requirements is elaborating performance indicators basically with digit i told you you have a citizen portal you've got an employee portal and we also have an admin portal where administrators can sort of monitor the uh, processes end to end and see where they need to make improvements right they have a birds eye view of the entire system so for the admin dashboard you need to have a clear idea of what your performance indicators are right what are the metrics what are the visualizations that your admin would like to see at least you should have a rough idea uh, before you start you know development so some things are like number of applications number of applications by status you know what is the average time to deliver the application uh, how many complaints do you have you know average time it took to resolve these complaints things like that this is again very generic sort of a thing but you need to have an idea of this so that when you get into the design uh, deeper you need to know what are metrics i'm going to model and based on that you will be able to derive some config okay um so it, uh, each indicator essentially can become a visualization in the decision support dashboard and you can derive the config from this list okay i'm just going to take a pause here uh, and uh, maybe ask for questions uh, and then we'll move on to the next section so if anybody has any questions on this section please speak up and we will try to answer any questions so far you on the table please sorry i'm saying i'm not seeing any questions in okay. the q and a table please yeah. cool. okay i'll move on uh, maybe you can type it in the q and a box and then we can address it later but i'll take a pause after each section just so it's not too overwhelming for you okay so the next step is designing services um, on digit now you've got your requirements you've modeled your requirements you have your workflow diagrams and your user stories and now you're going to try and figure out what are some of the services you need to design on digit 
So the first step in this is to be able to identify what, what are your registries and what are your services, okay? So this kind of a table is something that, you know, is going to uh, help you maybe. Basically, you've got a generalized activity and then you map it to this activity in this particular workflow, what it is. And then, you know, you have a verb and a noun mapping. So this is what I mentioned. When you model your activities, make it a verb noun pattern. So you can extract your verbs in one column. You can extract your nouns in another column and your activity itself as a column. So for example, there is a slight mistake here. This needs to be apply for service. Okay. It's not apply for birth certificate. So the generalized activity is apply for service specific to this use case. It's, you know, create a birth certificate, make payment is just make payment. This is all, by the way, flowing from that workflow diagram that I showed you earlier. Verify application, verify birth certificate in this specific case. Send notification is just that. And download some artifact, download birth certificate. Okay. This is just a sample. There may be more things you can extract from the workflow. This is just a sample I wanted to show. Now, what are the activities that we saw? We saw, you know, apply birth certificate, make payment, verify something, send notification, right? So all this we have modeled as verbs and nouns. Just pull out all the verbs in one column, pull out all your nouns. Now, all the verbs that you have are going to be your operations or APIs. Okay, the, you need to be able to expose APIs for all of these verbs. Now, all the nouns that you see, these are all your services or registries. So you need to have some kind of a birth registry. Uh, you need to have some kind of payment uh, service. And you need to have, uh, you know, sorry, this is not birth certificate. This is notification, right? So you need to have a notification service. So you've now come to some idea of what your APIs are going to look like and what are some of the services that you will need. The next step is just collate that table and make it like this. So basically the service is birth certificate. These are all the operations you need on it. All the verbs under that particular noun, just collate and notification is a service, you need to be able to send notifications. Payment is a service, you need to be able to pay or make a payment, okay? So once you get this table, it becomes very clear. You've got three registries and this many uh, operations on it. Now you have identified the master list of services and registries you need, but Digit already comes with a lot of these services, so you don't have to write them from scratch. So you need to identify what is already available in Digit and what do you need to build. So refer to the Digit architecture, which ones can be used as is, which ones may need to be customized, which ones may be need to build from scratch. These are some of the questions you need to be asking yourself. And for that, you need to do a deep dive of all the different services and figure out exactly if the functionality available matches what you need, okay? And you can also reuse registries, right? You can reuse the citizen registry, other employee vendors, things like that. So you can potentially reuse if you are just building a new module. If you are creating an entirely new domain, right? Then maybe you will not have some of these registries to be reused. Um, so you need to be asking these questions next. And this is just, again, it sounds pretty, uh, you know, prescriptive, but this is one way to go through it. If you need authentication, then you need the uh, user service. If you need to restrict functionalities, then you need access control. Uh, you know, if you need to have a bunch of reference data or master data, you need MDMS. Uh, if you need information to be presented to users in multiple languages, then you need localization service, so on and so forth. So you just need to go through each. So if you need payment, then you need payment service. If you are sending notifications, you need that. So basically just go through the list and see what all you can reuse from digit, okay? Um, and uh, one more thing is master data management service. So like I said at the beginning, there are, there is, we have something called the MDMS where we store uh, reference data or master data for a particular uh, module or a domain, right? Now this is something, this is data that is unchanging or uh, infrequently it changes. Uh, things like, you know, departments in a garment, uh, boundaries in a garment, trade license types, property types, all these kinds of things, these are fixed. They'll never change much. So it doesn't make sense to put them in a database and expose APIs for them. So instead of that, we have just created a, a config repository called MDMS, which will hold all this information as JSON. 
Okay, so you need to figure out what is this master data for your particular domain, right? Whatever it may be, what is this master data? And you need to clearly identify the separation between master data and the registry. You need to be thinking about it. Put unchanging data in MDMS, right? Put changeable mutating data in your registry. So you one, uh, once you have an idea of what you need to configure, then it becomes very simple to use this service. The next step is you have to be, so we have a workflow service at Digit. The workflow service is a simple state machine. It does not do anything complicated. It's not a rules engine. It's not a workflow engine even, okay? It's a state machine. So you can configure various states in your process. What are the actions that can be taken on those states? And who are the people who can take those actions uh, to get that information, right? You can make a table like this, for example, what is the state of the application? All applications start from a null state because nobody has done anything. Then which role can act? The applicant or an employee can act. What can they do? They can apply for a service. Similarly, if the state is awaiting verification, who is the role that can act? Verifier can act on it and they mark it as verified or they send it back for more information. Uh, you know, so on and so forth. So basically you are just, you know, detailing out what are all the different states in your application, how to, uh, you know, move from one state to another. You are just modeling it as a table. Once you have this, you can translate this into a JSON and post to our workflow API, workflow service API to configure the workflow for your module. Okay. The JSON for this how to do it, everything is available in our documentation website. I'll not go into it right now, but you can use Postman or something, authenticate to the server, and then go ahead and uh, come up with this JSON and post it. Uh, just to show you a sample JSON, let me see if I can. Okay, maybe I'll share it at the end. Hang on, let me see. Stop share. Add it here somewhere. Okay, I'll just share this for a second and then I'll switch back to it. Okay. I hope you all can see this. So this is essentially just, you know, how to, uh, this is how a sample workflow service configuration JSON looks like in digit. Before, can you see this? I can see this, but I think it's, uh, if you can, uh, you know, zoom into say next level, that will be helpful. It's, it would be better readable. That's it. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is better. Okay, fine. So basically, uh, this is how we configure the JSON for workflow. We define a states array. What are all the states defined for this module? And then, you know, the actions that can be done from this module. And what are the roles? Okay. And these roles that you define in the workflow needs to be configured in MDMS. These need to be present already as roles. Uh, and you, you know, that's it. A bunch of actions, whatever you need. So this is how it goes. For example, the state is applied from here. What do you need? Uh, you can do approve or reject. The employee role can take these actions and the next state will be approved, right? So this is how the state machine functions. We're just moving it from uh, one state to other. So that is just a sample. I'll switch back to my presentation again. Okay. So uh, the next step, once you've got your workflow configuration, you can also build API specs, okay? So we follow API first development. We define APIs as um, Swagger uh, Open API 3 specs, uh, YAML specs. And we have some recommendations on APIs, do's and don'ts. Uh, there have been certain design principles that have gone into um, creating the APIs for digit. We are deliberately minimal. Each service only exposes three to four APIs overall. All of our APIs are posts. We do not use the HTTP verbs uh, deliberately. All the parameters that need to go into that API are basically uh, need to go into the body of the post, okay? Including all the header related information, authentication tokens, things like that. 
and keep the mandatory fields to a minimum. Again, because of the breadth of uh, use cases that we cater to, because the government is so vast, this was a very deliberate decision. We cannot make certain things mandatory. So be very, very careful about marking fields as mandatory because it may differ from city to city, from state to state, uh, from one local body to another because we are such a diverse country. There are no uniform set of rules. So please be careful what you want to mark as mandatory. And be very detailed in your API spec, call out all the objects, call out all the attributes and give them a minimum length and the maximum length so that you can validate it. And these uh, attributes should map to the DB schema DDL. Make sure that you have a one-to-one -one correspondence there and that your schema will match this. Otherwise, if you define something here, and your DB has some other definition, you will fail. The request may fail to get persisted in the database, right? And then it will be a little bit of trouble uh, debugging it, troubleshooting it, et cetera. So make sure these things match. Um, and we already have a lot of common models available in the platform. So please use those, import those and use those. And for more of these APIs, do's and don'ts, you can look at our uh, link here. Uh, customization APIs, do's and don'ts. And uh, all of our service API specs are all available in GitHub for reference. So you can refer to those if you are building a new module. Okay. So uh, I spoke a little bit about MDMS and reference data. I'll just go a little bit deeper into it. So basically what is reference data? You can configure your tenants there. Who are your tenants? You know, is it a department, a country, a district? What is it? You can also have uh, multi-tenancy. You can have hierarchies in tenants. You can have a parent tenant, which is a state. And you can have children, which are like your ULBs or cities, right? So figure out who your tenants are. Figure out what the overall roles are in your particular domain or in your module, right? And put that in MDMS. So in MDMS, you configure roles under a folder under your tenant called um, access control roles, if I'm not mistaken. So there you add your JSON, you add all your roles. Again, documentation for how to do this, we already have on our website. And operations, basically, what are all the APIs you are exposing, right? From the API spec, these URIs, you have to put it in MDMS config called as actions. So essentially you are uh, deciding which ones you're going to expose via Zoom to the outside world, okay? Once you have your roles and your actions, you have to do the mapping. This is access control. Uh, which roles can access which APIs. You define it using role action mapping. Again, this is an MDMS. Then you can define boundary hierarchies for your tenant. Again, there is a particular JSON file that you put it in inside a particular folder in tenant. Uh, this you can do, right? And multiple hierarchies are possible. We, you can have admin hierarchies, revenue hierarchies, electoral, whatever else is there. And you can also add other module related constants, UI or otherwise in MDMS configuration. This could be like, if your front end is showing a bunch of drop downs, right? And these values are fixed and you can just add it in MDMS and your front end can query and get the data and populate the drop down. That way you are keeping it flexible. You can change it when you want, but you're also keeping it in one place. Okay, so this is reference data. There is more that you can define here and we have already defined, I'm not covering all the different uh, possibilities, just a few samples to kind of spark your thinking, okay? Um, once you have all these pieces, start developing your API sequence diagrams. This is sort of the low level design portion, right? You've got your high level design done. Now you're looking at low level design. Uh, start uh, figuring out your call flows, right? The, some examples I've given here, but I'm sure all of you will be able to figure this out. You know, basically which service calls into which service, what is returned, you just need to detail those out in API sequence diagrams. This is an example. I know this looks very busy and pretty small also, please bear with me. So basically a client sends a request to create a complaint to this public grievance service, okay? So what does this service do? It calls into MDMS to fetch master data for this service. MDMS returns it. Now this service validates the data and it searches uh, for the user that is sending this request based on the mobile number of the complainer. So you can look at the user service here, right? The call goes to the user service. The user service will return the user if he or she exists. Otherwise, 
we are going to create or update that user, get that new user. And then you are going to say, basically go generate a ID for me. So Ego, uh, I mean, Digit has an ID generation service where you can generate unique IDs for your uh, module, for your requests uh, based on certain templates or formats that you want to define. So this guy is saying, okay, now go and define an ID for this complaint, right? And you get a bunch of IDs. Now you are going to uh, search for the employee who's going performing the action, return the employee, so on and so forth. You know, it keeps going. And finally, at the end of it, the complaint data is published on the Kafka topic, right? And the persister service will con uh, consume this data from Kafka and sends it to the RDBMS. Right, and we also have this indexer service, which is not shown in this flow, but that will also consume the same data from the Kafka topic and push it to Elasticsearch for analytics. Uh, and then you know you can also send uh, notifications. You can create a message body, publish it on a Kafka topic to send SMS. The notification service will consume this SMS from Kafka and actually send the SMS. You can customize the template and all that. And then it's going to send the SMS. So this is a sample call flow diagram. Uh, you need to be able to do this across all your different requests, right? Flowing from your user stories, you have to figure out what are all the actions. And based on that, you can create these detailed sequence diagrams. Um, and lastly, you have to be able to de oh, sorry. design your user interface, okay? Again, most of this flows from your product team when they detail the user stories out and they create these workflow diagrams. So you'll have to be able to design the transactional user interface. By that, I mean the interface where your actors are going to interact with your system, your citizens and your employees, right? So each user story, uh, when you detail it out, it will lead to identifying pieces of the user interface that need to be designed. Example, a login story will lead you to login screen, forgot password, reset password flow, et cetera, et cetera. Then, you know, creating a birth application, when you detail it out, it's going to lead you to all the screens that you're going to need for that, so on and so forth, right? Nothing specific, it's very generic software stuff. Designing the performance dashboard is the second piece. This is your admin dashboard or the decision support dashboard. You would have defined these metrics or indicators ahead of time. So based on that, you need to come up with the design, which is your UI layout design, right? You have to figure out where you want to show what charts and uh, arrange them in a certain fashion in the UI. And the configuration bit of it to see the visualizations, right? Like the actual visualizations themselves, you can just write configuration on the back end. You don't have to write it from scratch. The UI layout also, it's just config, but you need to figure it out. What is the design? How is the layout going to look? And then you can just, uh, configure it accordingly. Again, there is more information on our website if you want to look at. So that is done. So these are typically the outputs that we look at from the design phase. We look at uh, process workflows, user stories, API specs in YAML. We look at the detailed design, low level design, class and database design, sequence diagrams, user navigation model, user interface design your dashboard design. And finally, based on all of this, you can come up with some kind of engineering plan with estimates. Now, if you have all these artifacts, you are ready to start development. This is how we do it inside eGov also. Uh, and once this clarity is there, hopefully development will be a piece of cake. That's all I had actually content wise for this presentation. Um, if there are questions, we'll start taking them now. Okay. Yeah, I'm seeing Deepak Kumar Sethi is asking, is it necessary to add epics and features in addition to user stories? Yeah, it depends. I think Deepak on how you do your uh, development, we do add epics uh, and, you know, features if you want to create for each task. Yeah, you can do that also. There is, like I said, this is not very prescriptive. We follow a general overall broad method and that might not be, you know, applicable to your case. But yeah, epics help, story points help and tasks under each story also help uh, to detail it out and sort of run your sprints and things like that. I hope that answers that question. 
um, what is the difference between service and registry? This is a great question. So we use the term kind of interchangeably here, which might cause a little bit of confusion. Basically, like I said, when you have that verb noun mapping, I said that your nouns map to services or registries. So it depends, right? Like some of the things, uh, mostly each registry will have a service corresponding to it. So if you have a you know user uh, registry, you have a user service. If you have, let's say, a property registry, you have a property service. But there are also services which are not backed by registries. Okay, these are just services. For example, your notification service does not have a registry, right? It's just going to send. Similarly, payment gateway does not have a registry. So it depends. There is the difference is a registry is a data repository, which is which contains validated, verified, reusable data that lives on forever. It's a single source of truth that's going to live on forever. A service is essentially a way to interact with the registry, you could say, or a service is something that performs a certain task. I hope that explains it. Uh, if you have doubts, then please go ahead. Why YAML only? Why not XML or JSON? I don't have an answer to this. This is what we have chosen to do. My colleague Satish is here. What is YAML? I why are we using YAML for a uh, lot of this configurations? Why are we not using JSON? Which or configuration? We are using JSON. Persister and uh, indexer and stuff. No, for all the MDMS data, we are still using the JSON. Yes, sir. Okay. Correct. I think uh, that's the standard format. I think uh, the internally was uh, discussed by architects and uh, the our uh, the CTO. So that's the one using it. I think we. I think we have multiple ways to do handle multiple things. Right? Right. So we thought AML is the best way to handle the configurations. But when it comes to master data, you can follow the JSON yes, structure. Correct. Because that is not a complete JSON, right? The AML is basically, the JSON structure is basically, you should be able to execute as a JSON and you can prepare the JSON script and then you can validate it. But AML is more of uh, not going to run uh, as a JSON script. That's the way, the reason they have included. But as I said, uh, the, the one thing can be done in a multiple way. So yeah. We thought AML is the best. We can try out JSON. Or you can also try out JSON. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but primarily, like Satish said, it's only for persister and indexer we use YAML. Other things are JSON. And deployment configs. Ah, deployment configs are also in YAML. Uh, other things are JSON. Why not XML? I think I personally prefer JSON to XML. I find XML pretty clunky, but you could the way you use it. Each person has their own opinions about this. Uh, Pragya Shri is asking, when can we get the recordings of these sessions? I don't know. Uh, Vibhor, Vibhor, please. Uh, we will make these uh, make this available. Uh, I think ASAP. We'll just download it and we'll okay. see the uh, usability on the public domain and we'll notify you. Most probably next week if everything goes well. Okay. So hopefully you got your answer, Pragya Shri. Uh, that's it for the questions, Vibhor, that I'm seeing. If anybody has anything else, we'll just give them a few moments to type in the questions. Sure. Can we hear uh, the audience? Is this what you all wanted to um, learn more about? Anything? Speak up, people. It will be nice to hear from you. Yeah, if you have anything to say, you can raise your hand and I can uh, make you available to talk. Can we have a demo? How can we exactly use Digit? Thank you. 
can this person please just elaborate what, what do you mean by that how can we exactly use digit meaning you want to see some kind of sandbox environment where you can log in and use it is that the question the application of the services yeah so we've got uh, you know multiple applications and things like that uh, there is also deployment of digit what exactly does this mean i don't know who this uh, attendee is so anonymous it says so uh, we can't unmute also vibor can unmute and check vibor can you check uh, if you have multiple anonymous attendees i guess you can't unmute but there is only one maybe you can actually uh, looks like this person must have joined from a phone and we are not able to see uh, the anonymous users in the list if they can hear us they can elaborate what exactly they're expecting it here yeah 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 not sure what this means also what is low code no code so this is a software concept right that's becoming very popular where uh, by writing minimum of code you are able to configure and implement a entire software system and kind of customize it to your needs without writing code that is what low code no code is digit is not low code no code as of the moment uh, digit does require knowledge of some programming skills it definitely requires knowledge of software development it's not low code no code but this is a very popular concept these but days but some of the components can be built on top of digit you know, can be like ha yeah low code not we can't say completely no code there is minimal configuration has to be uh, there so that we are already exploring on that uh, we are working on one of the poc as well correct correct yeah. you can choose to build on top of it and make it low code no code but the underlying platform itself is not low code no code for yeah. and we can't do it also because of the breadth of use cases we cater to in the government domain we cannot afford to make it extremely restrictive and it won't scale also for maybe us. the individual and partners can it can be for them it's, it's correct this can be low code no code correct. but for us it is we need to code it needs to be like this okay somebody else is mohammed sajid is asking as in the slide it is mentioned that digit uses only post method not put and get what does that mean okay basically what it means is we are so way back one of the decisions that was made was to not tie ourselves too closely to the http protocol because maybe at that point there was some imagination of you know porting digit across pro protocols so we tried to not rely overly on http concepts such as headers and you know all these verbs put and get so everything became a post and all the data that need that an api needs Uh, goes into the body of the body. post. So there are multiple parameters. Correct. Parameters. You can't put everything on the. Correct. The, so some of them, if you typically you have done REST development, some of it goes in as query parameters, some of it goes in as headers, mm -hmm. some of them are cookies, and then the rest goes into the body, which is a very typical HTTP way. We just decided to keep it all in one place, so it's easy to understand, and you know, you just push the entire body of the JSON uh, request to the uh, server for handling. So that's what it means. Uh, okay this is done one of the best examples of a low code platform is mindix mohammed is saying uh, okay sure there are many platforms low code no code great okay any other questions okay this somebody Uh, John Dixon is asking, "Do we have a working environment where we can access so that we can learn more?" We do. We have a staging environment. We have shared our daily providing aware of that. Raja is also. Okay, so we uh, Satish, my colleague, is saying there is a staging environment available for use by partners where you can log in and explore. I think Vibhor will be able to share the details if he has not shared it already. there are some process to be followed okay so it looks like there is a, some process to it how to get access to that environment but maybe vibhor can share more information on that with you later uh, john vibhor if you could just make sure you circulate that information that'll be great yeah okay uh, can we have a session on egovs experience of engaging with the government the challenges that you faced and how you overcame these during the implementation of digit 
this is a great question. Sure, we'll take this as feedback for our future sessions. I think this will fill a book <laughs> because it's been going on. It's been an evolutionary process over the past 19 years. So definitely, yeah. Uh, yeah, it'll be one big case study. How Digit has evolved, how eGov has evolved in catering to the government and where we started and where we are. I think that's a very interesting story for a session also. And in the big topic, yeah, definitely we'll take that feedback and we'll see if we can fit something in future sessions. Nitesh Parmar is asking, a simple tutorial on digit customization would help. Is there one on the website? There is one? There is yeah. a section no, in yeah, docs. So there is a digit customization section on the website. And I think Pradeep Kumar walked through digit config and customization yeah. just uh, today morning. Uh, today morning. 11 to 1, there was a webinar where he walked through it. Uh, and yeah, there is a small section on digit customization. It may not, I don't know what you're looking for. I think that for. session video can be shared uh, so that uh, the, yeah. the morning session, so if they are not attended, they can go through and then come back. Sure. Yeah. You can do that or, uh, you know, if that doesn't meet your needs or whatever, we'll figure it out. We'll answer your questions later. Tutorial. Okay, fine. Okay. Got it. What is the sequence label of API? What does that mean, Praveen? Are you asking about defining um, the actions for um, uh, in MDMS? Is that what this is in reference to? Okay. Sequence label, basically if you are defining a bunch of APIs to be exposed uh, through Zool, outside of Zool, right? You just need to give it some kind of an ID. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but sequence label of API, I don't know what this exactly means. So. Or uh, maybe you are asking about the sequence diagrams, API sequence diagrams. Huh, yeah, diagram. Okay, so this is the API sequence diagrams. It just shows the call flow. Between... Interaction, interaction between different microservices. Correct. In a given flow. For example, we have a create, update, and search API, right? So how the interaction, there are, we are in building multiple microservices. There are multiple microservices talk to each other, right? So how the, the interaction, when you say create, when you hit the create API, how the, the, the interaction between two different or three different services uh, flow, that is what is the sequence diagram, the interaction diagram, you can call it as interaction diagram. Correct. Okay. Um, I think this anonymous person who asked about a demo also, Somebody else asked if there is a sandbox environment, right? Mm -hmm. So that is our staging environment. So once you have access to it, you can explore on your own. Uh, I'm not sure I'm prepared for an environment demo right now uh, to show you exactly. And we may not have time also for that. John is asking whom should we contact to get access to the demo environment? Kindly share the contacts. You can contact Vibhor who is the host of this session, John. And uh, he's typing it in chat. He has given his email address so you can hmm. uh, write to him if you want access. He has typed it in chat just now at 3.51 p.m. Okay. Q&A. Sure. To a specific person. And somebody was asking about the customization configuration. That video is already available on the training and video pages. There are a lot of... Uh, uh, you know, demos and training videos available on our page and I've given a link in the chat. I would request, please go through this. There are a lot of uh, uh, module specific videos. There are a lot of configuration, customization related videos, some of the tech or architecture related videos. You will find a lot of content out there. Okay, somebody has posted in chat. Hello, how is the workflow extendable? Ahmed Gohar. Workflow is customizable, extendable in the sense you can configure your workflow through REST APIs. You can define what is the workflow for your module and you can call a REST API which will create a workflow for your particular module. Any of the core platform services we are not recommending to extend it. Huh. So the Correct. reason the, 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 the any services which are like the calculator service, business logic services Correct. can be extendable. But when it comes to the digit platform, 
we are not encouraging our partners to customize uh, uh, oh, things. Yes. Yeah, they can only configure it. Correct. They can't customize it or extensible. If they do that, there will not be any support from uh, Digit. Correct. Okay, there the support policy will not hold good if you have modified any of the core code. Correct. Yeah. And you will also have trouble upgrading. Yeah. Move Correct. between. Uh, that's the reason. Yeah. Correct. 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 So, uh, if you really have a use case that the Digit Core platform does not meet, we would like to hear about it. We'd like to see and evaluate it whether it fits into our larger roadmap and goals, and we can put in that feature back into the Core platform, and you can also contribute back to the digit plat platform and there is a process for that as well but yeah please do not customize core modules that's not recommended okay i guess no other questions and we are almost up on time also so before i leave it up to you if you want to leave it open for some more time yeah i think I think if there are no further questions, we can we can move on, and uh, we we don't stop here, uh, folks. Uh, please keep us. Uh, a, a, you can engage with us on the community uh, discussion forums. I've given those links out there. There are training videos. Even the videos of uh, the training of last two sessions will be made available on these sites, and we'll notify you as well over email. Uh, and uh, in meantime, I think. <laughs> there are a few questions that I, I just saw. Yeah, there is one question. When is no code planned to be released? It's no, not currently on our roadmap. Yeah. Because yeah, still we are working on uh, it's in yeah. kind of a POC from our end on okay, yeah. okay. So we don't have and again this this is we are not building it. So we have a like a community uh, and volunteers. So we are encouraging our community and volunteers to build it. Uh, we are also one of the community members in that. So okay. Um, they are they are the one going to build it. Okay, it could be one of you. So yeah, please right. plan for a low code, no code. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's not something. Yeah, that's... the community driven open source. Exactly, yeah. that's what the session is for, so that you guys can have ideas and go build for it. Yeah, we appreciate if uh, if folks uh, not only uh, engage in discussion but also contribute back to the community and uh, yes. and open and source. Second session also uh, previously the contribution one of the first contribution is from Bell uh, in the previous session each L N K study. Right. And, uh, the similar way contribution from other community members as well. Exactly. That's what makes a platform successful. Yeah. Adoption and it needs to grow. It needs to be live. So please, you are our partner. So please contribute back. You know, and build new fantastic things on top of Digit. Okay, then. Uh, oh, okay. In the last minute, there is another session. Uh, there is another question for you. Yeah, we don't have any GUI right now. We don't have any GUI no. for the workflow. Uh, it's all JSON config based through REST API. No, and no. also, this uh, whatever workflow engine we have, it is not a rule engine as of now. It is just a state machine. State machine, machine. yeah. So yeah. it doesn't have complicated business rules and stuff you cannot config. Yeah. Then I think that is the end of the day. Uh, and uh, uh, please leave your uh, feedback in the form that you will see uh, right after the, the end of the session. Uh, and let us know what you expect in the future, uh, you know, uh, programs, future trainings. Uh, we'll try to incorporate as much content as uh, per your uh, feedback and suggestions. Thank you, Subhashini. Thank you, Satish, for helping us with this session. Yeah, thank, thank you, everybody. You. Thanks, Vibhur. Bye, folks. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.